Welcome to the Film Science, the Double Featured Podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience and the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash film We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $5 tier grants the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn and sit back and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is the Film Science, where movies are more than just entertainment to their any experience there an experience all around you. You, you, you and welcome back to another episode of the film assign thank you guys for joining us today today i am joined by my bullied friend lucy bullied friend you can join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for brand new episodes of the Film Steins. Some recent episodes include our award ceremony, Imaginary, The Baba Duke, Dirty Dancing, and The Taste of Things. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas over on our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins. Come request a movie. Come subscribe for a dollar. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys so much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we're discussing the 1983 film The Outsiders by the Godfather himself. Francis Ford Coppola. Of course, he's famous for being related to Nick Cage. But I'm happy to report back after watching The Outsiders for the second and last time. Damn. (laughs) (laughs) This movie kind of sucks. I was a little softer on it. Critically, I guess. That is the first time watching it. For whatever reason, I can't really recall. But after re-watching it, it's hard to believe this is the same man who put out Apocalypse Now and The Godfather. It's a great example of someone having a specific story to tell and perfecting it, but not able to tell other stories in the same way, right? You might be a great fresco painter, but suck with watercolor or whatever Bob Ross was using, acrylics. I'll be happy to tell you why this movie sucks, but I know you're a huge fan of the book, our source material. And if I remember correctly, at the very least, you used to like this film. So I'm very curious how you feel about this today, The Outsiders. Yeah, I read this book when I was in seventh grade. I think it was one of those required reading by one of our teachers and absolutely loved it. It wasn't long after that that I got my hands on the DVD. I don't really remember how. That's such an odd request to ask my parents, like, can you buy me this DVD? But I did. I had it. And I remember like taking it around and showing all my friends who also had read the book in the same class. I would bring it to like sleepovers and stuff. This was your sleepover movie? This was our (laughs) sleepover movie. Yeah. And I, I loved it. I loved the movie. But seeing it today, I really had to be analytical of the film itself without tying it to the source material. Looking at the film like if I wouldn't have read the book. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? (laughs) I hate that it doesn't do a great job explaining what's going on. It does a terrible job letting you know what's going on. Do you even know that there's a rivalry between the social classes here? Do you know that this is like a coming of age story? Or do we just have a bunch of young boys and something happens? (laughs) Does anyone actually grow and learn from this? Do they develop? Like, do you understand that this is a story of friendship or that there's characters here who are stereotyped and you learn to have empathy for them? Because these are very prominent themes in the book that I feel like are completely missed in the movie here. Totally. That's probably one reason it's a canonical read in somewhere like middle school. It's obviously a coming of age film in its purest form. But it's the definition of all style, no substance, the film is. 
I used to feel like it was very true to its source material, but rewatching it now, it really isn't. It completely misses a lot of the points, but I just tied this with being true to its source material because the dialogue is like verbatim from the book. We're just missing all of the nuanced dialogue and interactions. Yeah, we're missing the the why does the story need to be told? Yeah, it's I imagine especially coming from someone who has read a lot of stories that have landed on the big screen. Placing images and visuals to what you have in your head and almost legitimizing it in some way because there's no doubt there's something that fantastic and maybe a little manipulative about what happens when something like the outsiders or whatever adaptation hits the big screen it helps legitimize it as a franchise as a fandom i think we saw a little bit of that with dune part one and it's explosive kind of love and you see that with all kinds of shit truthfully which is fine ender's game right yeah that was somewhat liked back in the day Especially its visuals. I don't know why that was. That trips me up. And it's a little manipulative because you guys all have the context. You know, people who know the book, the source material, can fill in all the gaps and you're seeing all the high points of the material, which can be a problem. It isn't necessarily a problem, but it can be. And I'm not familiar with the book at all. I missed it. It seems to be a very canonical read in middle school, like I said, but I didn't read that. And there's some very obvious things that are happening here, like it being a coming-of-age film and about a character who is misunderstood and gets caught up in their lifestyle. That's very obvious, right? But no, you don't know there's rival gangs. You know, that guy's looking for Dallas, and I'm just like, I don't... It makes it feel like the greasers don't really have an alignment. They are just the greasers by being the outsiders, being the other guys across the tracks, and therefore really don't have... Like anyone that they call their own other than their their brothers and then the people on their block kind of thing. Like every block is its own gang of greasers kind of thing. You know, it's like there's just no alignment. It's what it kind of makes it feel like immediately. And before I forget, I did want to say, I know uh, Ponyboy and Johnny, you know, are hanging out with those girls at the drive-in. And they're like, how old are you? And Ponyboy and them say like 14 and 16 or something like that. First of all, Johnny looks way younger than Ponyboy and he's supposed to be older. Yeah, that's intentional. Oh, that's intentional? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Because I do appreciate in this film, nothing to do with the outsiders, but we have some kids who look like kids for the most part. I was like, in the 80s, I mean, I just felt like this was, I feel like this has always been a problem. And so I really appreciate, you know, kids playing kids. I was like, holy smokes. It hurts the film, maybe, because the acting kind of sucks. And the ADR is terrible at times. Specifically for Ponyboy and Johnny, and maybe even more specifically on Ponyboy, which is kind of bad because he's our central lens. So, yes, I'm like mildly confused why any of this is important, but at the same time, it's a simple story, so it's not hard to just be along for the ride. But I feel like there was kind of a lot of context missing, and I don't know if that was just because the movie was missing a lot, or was it just bad direction and just totally beautiful shots first and foremost i don't think the film itself the content was missing a lot you know we have our central character pony boy here we have johnny and dallas who are basically the three most important characters these are the characters we're following and they're the ones who the story is about we have the socias who are the rich people on the other side of the tracks, you know? The other other side. The other other side. <laughs> we have them. We have pretty much our four main socias. We have Cherry, her friend, Bob, who's the guy who gets killed, and Randy, the um, curly-haired guy. And then we have the rest of Pony Boy's gang, his two brothers, Tubit and Steve. And pretty much everything that happens is true to the book. You know, uh, Johnny kills Bob. They're on the run. There's a church that burns down. They save some kids. Johnny dies. Dally dies because of Johnny dying. They have a big rumble. The only thing that's not exactly true is the ending, but 
it's not a true versus not true ending. It's just uh, what they decided to take out of the movie, which I don't understand why they did. But it's it's there. The content itself is there. It just does a terrible job of explaining what I'm seeing. It's like the dialogue they took from the books was just to take it from the book and say you adapted this fully instead of either taking out what actually matters and making it your own or making it completely your own and telling the story how you felt it as the reader. In the book, we follow Pony Boy and basically all his thoughts, all his interests, everything. You know, he's a very emotional, vulnerable, reflective kid. And he's always thinking about the world and how he sees it and all the events going on in his life. We have a very big narrative from Pony Boy. We know everything he's thinking. We know everything about his two brothers because of him. We fall in love with these two brothers because of him. And it just seems like in the film here, we don't have anything from Pony Boy. Nothing. We don't know anything about him. We don't know anything about why we give a fuck if he gets taken from his brothers or not. Why it matters so much that Derry hit him, which is the catalyst of them running away. Yeah, we really only get this case build up for him being misunderstood in his little clique. And at the very least, enjoy reading and being maybe a little bit of a romantic, I guess the greaser imagery and attitude is in, his, is in, in itself sort of romantic, or at least at the time. And especially how we look back at it. But there is, at the very least, something kind of intellectually yearning in him. And that kind of seems to trinkle down to, or trinkle up, however you want to look at it, to Johnny a little bit. Him being inspired and maybe being the only person who really gets Pony Boy. But it's it's really only simply because of what he's reading and him being interested in Robert Frost. So it's nothing more than an archetype. Right. We needed a lot more maybe inner dialogue or monologues. He was supposedly bullied and like beat up at the very beginning of the book, right? Yeah. We don't really get a sense of him being bullied outside of just being maybe young, right? Mm-hmm. A, young, a younger greaser in this group of greasers. Of course, he's going to be picked on a little bit, but getting beat up and just being picked on, kind of different things, right? It doesn't really... We didn't really get the stage set quite right for who Pony Boy and Johnny were. It's important that Johnny looks that young. Don't just shock me with it, you know. <laughs> Let him get bullied or something, because apparently that's a thing. And I know that's, I don't know, part of me can see someone wanting to try to tell a story where you can get that without showing it. But no matter what, bullying is very powerful and it can be used correctly. I don't know what the restraint was to not see that and i guess that was in the director's cut right right which let's talk about that for a little bit you have in the director's cut this opening scene where he's getting beat up everyone comes and save him we're establishing character right there we're establishing that there is beef between the greasers and the socias these random kids are getting bullied by these you know sophisticated elite people We have the gang rushing to save them along with his brothers. We get a little bit more character from his brothers. Instead of, you know, just seeing them for two minutes, we get actual more screen time with them so we can give a fuck about why they should stay together as a family. So that's great. That whole setup is great. But instead you have Pony Boy writing a story. I don't know if that was obvious that he's writing a story for school. And this is what initiates the whole movie. It's obvious he's writing something for school. I don't know. Okay. That would have been a good establishing point because this film, by the end of it, starts to feel like we're playing. We're having pretend time in the backyard with our group of 15 friends who are on two different, you know, who are at war with each other. Like pretending though, like just playing, yeah. not actually fighting. And then the movie is literally a child's imagination of how this play unfolds in the backyard. That's how I kind of interpreted the movie because of how little we got from it. Yeah. 
which I wish that would have been tied in at the end a little bit more that he's writing this story. And like you said, that would have fit perfectly because this did feel almost like it was a story told from a 14 year old's brain. But we'll get to that in a little bit. After Ponyboy's introduced and we can tell he's writing a story when I walked out into the sun, whatever he says, and then it cuts into this opening credit scene and they're playing that stay gold song and it lasts forever like what the fuck how do you go f- from that how do you go from setting up the scene so perfectly with pony boy getting beat up to this how do you make that decision because that's so bad yeah the opening and ending song were tonally just not right the songs felt like they may have fit a spike lee movie a little bit more or something yeah i too was confused by the soundtrack because we also have some very you know rock and roll songs playing throughout when they're at the diner or the movie theater the drive-in whatever we have a lot of rock and roll music and then we have this soft i guess it was stevie wonder who wrote that song or who sang it or at least one of the versions from what I could tell on Wiki. And it's just so drastic. And I don't know if that was supposed to be a representation of the greasers themselves. I mean, I think you said it earlier and you said it so well that they're these romantic guys. You know, they're they're the emotional ones. They're the vulnerable ones. Misunderstood. The misunderstood ones. So is this that music trying to show us both of their personalities, like something so soft and golden, along with some, you know, some spice, some rock and roll? I don't know, but it was very weird and it didn't compliment and it didn't translate like that whatsoever. With the end, too, I just I feel like we should have stuck with the book a little bit more in the end after Johnny dies and Dally dies. Pony Boy is really fucked up. He's fucked up in the head. He's, you know, he's grieving like he should. And he all of a sudden has these thoughts that Johnny is still alive and he's the one who killed Bob. And he doesn't he doesn't understand why other people don't understand that he's the one who caused all this. He's the one who should be guilty. He should be sent to jail or whatever. He should be accused for Bob's death. And he learns to grieve and process this and you know he's failing classes he's not reading anymore he's fighting all the time with dairy and after having a conversation with one with one of his teachers he told him that if he completes this assignment which is to write about anything important in your life then you know he could pass the class which is what prompts him writing this book yeah that would have helped ground this completely seeing a school scene would have really helped this reminds me of what roger ebert said back in the day the thin narrative material for the outsiders only adds up to a movie of 90 minutes of course that's the original not the director's cut it wouldn't have helped roger um you're good and even then there are scenes that seem to be killing time nothing that happens in this movie seems necessary it's all arbitrary and that's it helps build this case in my mind for exactly how I felt about this movie and that it was just all for play. None of this really happened kind of thing. But having a school scene, having real fights between the brothers or real argue, some kind of some kind of conflict that wasn't between the gang members or the, mm-hmm. the two different classes would would have helped ground this in a a meaningful way. That would have been great. Some scenes to help humanize Pony Boy. More monologues out of him throughout the film. In my head, this would have definitely made it a coming of age film. Him learning from this experience, him taking something out of his life and actually going from a boy to an adult and experiencing these things is what makes a movie a coming of age movie. Just because something horrific happens in your life doesn't mean you're going to learn from it. On contrary, I'm sure a lot of people don't. A lot of people just hide in that anxiety and that grief. Yeah, coming of age is a present progressive action. Getting kicked in the nuts <laughs> and being told what reality is full of is not coming of age. It could be part of it, of course, but... 
exactly it was missing that it was missing that resolution of so what if johnny dies so what if dally died what about this why should i care it's all arbitrary it's because it's all play you know they didn't actually die or in the backyard and they're eliminated from play because they got killed in the story basically it you see what i'm saying that that artifice that comes out of this it feels like it's of a child's mind which can be a very good thing in this movie because it is a coming of age film but it spins it in a little bit too of a adolescent way it doesn't ground itself in any kind of reality yeah we definitely needed the school scene would have been great there really would have it would have helped ground it one of the other big things in this book and i mentioned it a little bit in the introduction is this empathy between the lower and upper class between the socias and the greasers i just want to say the division was so like explicit it felt kind of cartoony you know there was no place where these people were like i don't know forced to get along because of school or because they lived in the same town there it was just it felt so the conflict felt very organized like they were playing i guess to be fair kind of like you mentioned earlier i did get that there was this social divide this this class division right that was very clear based off of just the houses <laughs> and the clothes and I think that's that's good that we got yeah. that, but we were missing the empathy and the character understanding. We were missing them having this moment of, oh shit, you're human too, and breaking down the stereotypes from each other. I feel like we kind of got a little bit of that when we had that scene with Randy, and he's trying to tell Pony Boy that he's not going to fight at the Rumble, and... Then he tells him, then he proceeds to tell him, like, it doesn't matter. This fight doesn't matter. You guys will never win. But that's pretty much all we got, which is it enough? Yeah, that scene is super forced and it's really good, actually, like, out of context. But it's just like, what? It was very forced. And all the bits with Cherry were forced, too, I think. Like, oh, I watch Sunsets too, Pony Boy. It felt like someone was reading. From the book, from the yes, book. Yeah. yes. And in my mind, as a child, I associated that with, oh, this is so true to its worst material because it's actually quoting the book. But now that I can use my little brain, I'm like, oh, actually, no, that's awful. Why did you do this? And you can see a lot of those shots in your mind's eye, or at least I can. And so there's something really manipulative there about it being really stylized and beautiful and and memorable and it almost requires a second watch just to kind of sparse through that and i couldn't help but to come to the conclusion that it was all style but substance a great example of it i can't actually think of a better example I, we watch so many movies i don't <laughs> they're just in and out pretty quick but this movie is really favored i don't know if you saw that no i didn't because the book is so good because everyone has read this book. It's truly iconic. Yes. So it's hard to separate what you already know in your head. It's hard to not fill in those blanks using context clues. We've done that our whole lives. Or at least some of us aren't doing it as well as we should. But we do. And it's hard to separate that. So since this book is so loved, of course this movie is going to be loved. It's probably something that To Kill a Mockingbird faces. Mm, yeah, good point. Also coming from, to many, one of the greatest directors to ever walk the earth. Right, because I feel like movies that I should talk all the time compared to their source material, Ender's Game, Aragon, those movies, those books weren't quite as read as To Kill a Mockingbird or The Outsiders. Totally, yeah. So it makes sense that these movies are so favored. And it's just so sad because these are truly wonderful literary pieces that deserve their justice on the big screen because it's not that hard to put these themes 
into a moving picture. <laughs> this should be a pretty easy movie yes, to make. Yes, yes, it should. The hardest part should be the fighting, and it's also bad. It wasn't <laughs> but that bad. It was so bad. It's, <laughs> I guess it's fine for the times where fighting has come a long way. There's no doubt about it. But it's true. It's very true. The fighting, I just wanted to say, did kind of feed into this play <laughs> thing in the backyard that I have going on in my mind. Where we play hit each other. It's just, <laughs> I'm laughing by the end of it. How did you feel about our cast here? This ensemble. I mean, visually, they're great. Everybody looks good. It's funny, you know, seeing Tom Cruise in this and, you know, Patrick Swayze. And the Karate Kid. How much more iconic can you get than the Karate Kid? Well, I've never seen the Karate Kid. <gasps> but it is quite the cast. It is quite the cast. And I'm not sure if any of these are debut films for any of these boys, but they're so young. And it is funny watching them on screen. But I do like how they looked. I like that like 80s physique they have going on here. You know, they're tough guys. But they're not big and buff like we would see guys maybe now. I don't know what kind of physiques we would get trying to do a movie with actors today set in the 80s or 60s or whatever. Like Patrick Swayze. I mean, that guy was very like lean. but Full of muscles. His muscles had muscles. His muscles had muscles. We'd probably get a bunch of Zac Efron's in the remake <laughs> of this. They're all jacked and on steroids and shit. I know. Like, how well, is it even possible with some of these actors today? You know, they're either lean or they're jacked. There's no Patrick Swayze's. But I did appreciate the actors, the choice. Everyone did what they could with what they had. I really like. The leather jackets and all the greaser, the hair, the makeup, everything to the the cars. So at least we had that going on. Yeah, no, totally. It's the style thing. They Francis knows at the very least how to make a film look pretty. I will say it's such a weird thing to point out to in a movie, especially of the time, the 80s and before and stuff. But the... That look of it's just on a soundstage. You know, it's all artificial and not on location in any way whatsoever. Not built out. I always feel a little weird when I feel that way. When I feel like I see that, you know? Yeah. Especially that scene when Johnny passes out or he's dying or whatever. Like, he was close to sticking his tongue out and pretending he was dying. (laughs) Yeah. And like, like the houses and stuff. They just look like they're perfectly dirty, you know? Mm-hmm. There's nothing natural about them. And I don't know if those houses are on-location houses or if they were built on a soundstage, but they definitely look like they were. They were yeah. definitely caught just right. And that totally works for, you know, all kinds of movies. But it reminds me of that Robin Williams film. I guess Steven Spielberg directed it. Hook, it's just so ugly in that way. <laughs> But shout out to Nick Cage for being a fighter in the Rumble. Shout out to the author, too. Apparently, she was a nurse. She was Dally's nurse. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't know. That's awesome. Yeah. But why is Nick Cage in here? I don't know. He's related to Francis. Is that it? Nick Cage? Is that it? <laughs> well, man, thank you for watching this movie and bringing it to my eyes and covering it here today. You're welcome. I apologize for your... My magic lost? Your magic lost. Your Shinigami eyes exposing the atrocities of this exercise in... I don't know, like a filmmaker saying, I can make anything into a film and I don't really got to give it that much attention. Yeah. Because I just have a good eye. Yeah, me too. I mean, I wasn't lying when this was a sleepover movie I would bring parents would look at me like why is this child bringing you know that makes sense actually because of all the young guys in it you know yes that makes sense to me soda pop was a fucking cutie patrick swayze was a cutie. i mean i mean all of them really are cuties yeah after thinking about it for a second i was like that actually is exactly okay exactly it's a little different than like shrek or me girls (laughs) yeah zach efron cutie but i get that well man do you have a budget guess for me here today 
Yeah, my my budget guess is $5 million in 1983 money. Well, apparently it was $10 million in 83 money. Are you kidding me? $10 million? They had to build out Man. buildings. <laughs> they had to make some buildings. But it went on to make $33.7 million, a little bit of money. Ooh, good, good. And apparently over on Letterboxd with 270,000 people, Ooh. they gave it a 3.6. It's way too high. That's a little high. That's a little high. I gave it a 2.5, and I had the hardest time writing out a 2. <laughs> Believe me. This is a 1.5. This yeah. is an easy 1.5 for me. Yeah, I'm still biased. There's something that holds it above a 1 here because of its artificialness and its in the way it's told. I like the angle of it being in Pony Boy's head and it not actually being how anything played out it's just all pretend but some school scenes would have definitely elevated this movie totally yeah and a little bit more character from everybody better acting would have helped that if i had to guess was probably directing problem i think francis probably just got a little too committed to to what the movie really is and maybe he's a big fan of the book and was like all right yeah i got this yeah and i'm sure he's surrounded by yes men Right? So, it's like, how do we get the, from point A to to C? We're missing a little bit of context there, maybe. Yeah, it's almost missing, like, the opposite of what I think is the Harry Potter film problems. The Harry Potter films didn't have enough of a fan, a true fan there to keep them in check. And this movie lacked someone who hasn't read the book to see if it even makes fucking sense. To the outsiders. Yeah, totally. Well said. All right, man. Well, thank you for this talk. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Filmasteins. Remember, we post every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over on Patreon.com slash Filmasteins, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas over on our Patreon as well. Leave nice reviews on Apple Podcasts. Come request a movie. Come subscribe for a dollar. Come right in. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. But until next time, take care. Bye-bye. Can I request Karate Kid? Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film Lines. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained some new insights and perspectives on the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching, keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Film Steins, signing off. <laughs> Stay gold, pony boy. Oh.